four more batteries. This is a very important slide. I've taken this from Bilski's original um, study that was published in Journal of Neurosurgery Spine in way back eight years ago, in which they showed that if you had epidural spinal cord compression, and if it's a low-grade compression or a high-grade compression, and depending on their grades and the tumor load, you can decide how much of epidural spinal cord compression there is and what kind of treatment you'd give. So, for example, if you have these patients who are radio sensitive and then you've got patients who have an unfavorable prognosis with uh, radiation. So all these patients who uh, from breast, lymphoma, seminoma, myeloma, prostate, obviously they have a good outcome with external beam radiation. Whereas rest of them, sarcoma, melanoma, GI, renal, could have unfavorable prognosis. So you, depending on your tumor load, how much of pressure there is, and are you radio sensitive or radio resistant, you can decide what kind of treatment you're going to give to these patients. So for example, if you have got a radio sensitive tumor, which has got low grade, only radiotherapy would suffice. If you have got a low grade with radio resistant, you can think about a fusion if there is instability along with stereotactic radio surgery or separation surgery, which I will talk about later. On the other end, if there is high grade compression, severe compression of the cord, you could think about with radio sensitive, just external beam radiation and they'll do well. Or you could think about surgery followed by radio surgery. And all these are um, sensible outcome, common sense um, sequelae. So radio sensitive tumor, something like multiple myeloma. So you look at this, that you know this is their study. In August, um, on 22nd of uh, July, they had this uh, low grade compression with radio sensitive external beam radiation was given. And you see nine days down the road, you, you do a scan and you see that is nearly recovered. So this is all very good. It's important for us to know all this. On the other hand, you can think about if somebody who's got high grade tumor and you've got a lot of pressure, then radio surgery followed by radio surgery could be an option. So norms helps us in making those decisions. So uh, then we had recommendation for stereotactic radio surgery in which we said that low quality evidence is there. The radio surgery should be considered over conventional fractional radiotherapy for the treatment of solid tumor spine metastasis in setting of oligometastatic disease or radio-resistant histology in which there is no relative contraindicator. And we said that this is safe and effective. And now many people are using stereotactic radio sur um, surgery along with surgery as a separation surgery and to give patients maximum benefit from radiation as well as surgery. So for example, if you've got radio-resistant tumor high grade, you do surgery, you can do a separation surgery in which you separate the tumor from the cord uh, or you could excise as much as you can and give re stereotactic radio surgery a specific dose with the help of your on oncologist. And they play a huge role here. So direct decompression, surgical resection and treatment of spinal cord compression caused by metastatic cancer, a randomized trial. This was the game changer that actually changed the way we used to think about metastatic of spine. This was published way back in Lancet in 2005, and they showed that direct decompressive surgery plus post-operative radiotherapy is much superior to treatment with radiotherapy alone for patients with spinal cord compression by metastatic cancer. And the reason this trial was actually stopped halfway because they, th they saw the results of surgery with radiotherapy were much superior to radiotherapy alone. And this was the graph that they showed that uh, mobility, uh, outcome, um, sphincter incontinence, uh, all that was better in, in the group which had surgery as well as radiotherapy. So this uh, was a game changer in 2005. So, for, for example, if they showed that overall ambulation with surgery was 84% versus 57% with radiation. If you said the duration of outcome, you look at, so it's 122 days 
versus 13 days. Recovery of ambulation, 62% in surgery patients who had no ambulation versus only 19% with radiation alone. Continence was for, for much prolonged time compared to only 17 days in with radiation. The amount of analgesia required was much less and the survival time was better. So they were better in all these groups and so this trial was stopped and the patients were then just put on uh, the group with surgery plus radiation uh, from hence onwards. So surgery, a strong recommendation is made that patients with high grade spinal cord compression due to solid tumor malignancy undergoing surgical decompression stabilized followed by radiotherapy. Neurological functional outcome, pain control, complication thoroughly documented and improved by surgery and radiotherapy. So same thing we are, going to, we are showing over here again. So then we need to see are there any risk factors for pathological uh, fractures. So if you get a patient with spinal metastasis, if somebody shows you a scan, somebody tells you a story, are you going to fuse them or are you not going to do anything with those patients or are you going to send them for radiotherapy? So the risk factors we saw were pain, if the patient had severe pain, if the tumor size within the vertebral body, vertebral end plates and there were three column involvement. If you had that, primary tumor growth rate was higher, multiple vertebral metastases were present. This was associated with increased risk for pathological factors. So anytime you see a patient with these things, you need to think about doing something for them instead of just sending them radiotherapy. Vertebral posterior elements and costovertebral vertebral junction involvement by tumor, primary tumor growth rate, and the presence of visceral metastasis <laughs> were associated with metastatic epidural spinal cord compression or nerve root compression. So you knew if you had that involvement, then you may need to decompress these patients. So patients with osteolytic spinal metastasis lesion causing pain greater than 25% occupancy of the vertebral body and involvement of vertebral end plate or involvement of all three columns, you need to be thinking about prophylactic or therapeutic decompression and stabilization. So these are the patients that you should be thinking of doing something for them trying to prevent a pathological fracture, trying to prevent uh, worsening neurology that you may not be able to correct afterwards. So separation surgery. This came in with the association of oncologists, radio, stereotactic radio surgery specialists working together with minimally invasive spine surgery. For example, a patient like this, they went in, did a uh, myelogram, saw exactly where the compression was, decompressed, separated the tumor from the cord, put in screws over there, stabilized the patient and sent for serotactic radio surgery straight away. And if they did that, then you, they had patients like these with liposarcoma uh, who did very well following this. So this was just separated and then fused and sent for serotactic radio surgery. And the results were very good. So impact of histology and delivered dose on local control of spinal metastasis treated with stereotactic radiosurgery. And they showed that only significant factor predicted of local control was related to actual dose of the radiation given. It has to be decided along radiation oncologists. So coming to mechanical instability in these patients, obviously that's very important for us. And the, so we did a comparison between minimally invasive spine stabilization with or without posterior decompression for management of spinal metastasis. So patients who were treated without decompression had a shorter operation time, less blood loss, a higher rate of discharge home, and lower in-hospital mortality, indicating a procedure with lower inv invasiveness. Uh, so there is advantage in patients who have got milder paralysis in which in, in whom you can think about stabilizing without decompressing. Whereas patients with severe paralysis with more than uh, D2 level of Franco grading, you can think about um, decompression as well in these patients in whom where there is severe uh, Franco grading involvement. So, Spinal oncology study group came up with SINS, which is Spine Instability Neoplastic Score. It is reliable, 
high inter inter uh, relative reliability it's valid and substantial agreement about sin score and expert opinion so if you look at sins sins has got um, location where exactly it is is it a mobile segment or a rigid segment depending on that we get score so if it's rigid we get less score if it's a mobile segment it's a junction we get higher score knowing that there will be more pressure on that level if patient has pain then they get higher score pain free less score so this tells us there's instability or not bone lesion is lytic mixed or just blastic if it's blastic you get less score we know that with lytic there is a higher chance of fractures so if, is there a radiographic spinal al alignment subluxation translation or is there de novo deformity like kyphosis or scoliosis uh, normal alignment as well um, I think vertebral body collapse with more than 50 degree collapse you get three whereas none of the above you get zero so depending on collapse or not and posterior lateral involvement of spinal um, elements bilateral unilateral and none of the above so all these play a role and if you got a score zero to six you know that these patients are stable and you may not have to do anything for them except for when we see the, those other risk factors we talked about uh, potentially unstable is 7 to 12 and stable is 13 to 18. I just want to reply to a question from Mahmood who's just said that I'm quoting a 2005 citation I said this study was the game changer uh, we are not talking about that study is still valid today we are talking about this is why we moved on so this was a study that should come in all our presentations before we go on to be talking about other new studies that we are, I just quoted. So for example, if you've got a patient like this, um, uh, we have got multiple lesions involvement, but there is, uh, at the same time, there is no um, a problem with the junctional status, there's no problem with pain relief, patient has little pain, uh, bone lesions are not involved, um, radiographic we see that there is, is a normal alignment there there's no problem with alignment so this patient is stable and we know that so we don't need sense to tell us but it's just to put it in there to tell you that this is how we put this in so is there involvement of posterior lateral elements so we know that's unilateral involvement of these as so the total score is five so you don't need to fuse this patient if you look at it, on the other hand, this uh, CV junction instability because of this uh, lesion, and if you put the score, the score comes back up to 14 because we have got more than 50 collapse. We have got a spinal alignment that's gone. We have got mechanical um, uh, pain as well, and it's a junction involving of uh, four C elements. You get the score of 14. These patients require clearly require surgery. So this is, these are quite clear type patients. Then you may have some patients in between in whom the decision can be made by us at that stage. So if you look at the prospective evaluation um, of the relationship between mechanical stability and response to palliative radiotherapy for symptomatic spinal metastasis. So if we took 155 patients with painful metastasis from two tertiary hospitals and patients reported pain response and prospectively, uh, prospectively this was assessed post-operatively of the 124 patients that we had at the end 16 patients experienced a complete response and 65 experienced a partial response it clearly showed if the sins was lower there was final stability and this was associated with complete pain response to radiotherapy so this supports the hypothesis that pain results from mechanical spinal instability responds well to radiotherapy compared with pain from local tumor activity. So then we brought in Tomita score in which it's quite simple that we have got primary tumor showing good tumors, moderately good tumors and bad tumors. And then you have visceral metastasis, yes. A treatable visceral metastasis or untreatable visceral metastasis and bony metastasis is solitary or isolated and multiple and then we gave scoring according to that tokohashi on, on the other hand this is a modified tokohashi score which shows that we use patient's condition Kornofsky scale number of metastases metastases to major organs removable non-removable 
primary site depending on good, good or bad. So good gets zero, bad gets maximum. And then if there is a Frankel policy or not, or if it's Frankel E, which is none, so you get um, a higher score or lower score depending on that. And then depending on these scores, we can decide what kind of outcome these patients would have, that we give conservative treatment, palliative treatment, or we think about excisional surgery in these patients. The other score which I'm going to be talking about is modified bar score scoring system for palliative prediction of metastatic spine. And this can tell you the amount of months left for you to live. If you had no visual metastasis, you get one point. It's a very simple score. No lung cancer, one point. Primary tumor coming from breast, kidney, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, you get one point. And if you've got a solitary skeletal map, you get one point. And depending on the scoring system, we can predict quite well uh, about 4.8 uh, a month uh, total points two you get about 18 months and total points three to four you get 24 months 28 months so you can decide how a patient very quickly percutaneous posterior fixation if you've got intermediate sins you can think about just doing percutaneous surgery for them and at the same time uh, then think about stereotactic radio surgery Kyphoplasty, again, you've got unstable since 13, you just proceed with that. So if you've got metastatic tumor assessment, we, did about, we talked about the stuff that we need. So depending on norms, if you've got low grade, no myelopathy, you can think about radiation, external beam. If you've got radiosensitive, radiation, radio resistance, separation surgery, or stereotactic radio surgery, mechanical, if it's stable, unstable. Depending on sense, you can decide. And systemic, will they be able to tolerate surgery or not? So Tokohashi scored and other prognostic factors in 260 patients with surgery of um, vertebral metastasis. And they showed that the time for cancer diagnosis to metastatic diagnosis of synchronous was less than two years, two to five years, or more than five years. So they could predict that what kind of outcome these patients would have. So, and then there was a study showing the pre-treatment albumin level, primary cancer site, Karnofsky score, number of visual metastases could be significant. So we looked at all these studies and we said, okay, let's have a look at these and find out. Let me see if I can move this here. I'm sorry, just trying to move it from. Okay, that's gone. Um, so we published this uh, surgically treated spinal metastasis do prognostic score have a role um, and we looked at that is there efficacy of these prognostic factors that we have been dealing with and which is more sensitive and we what if applied on all these scores and see can we predict and we showed that tomato score provided the highest statistical significance to predict the outcome followed by bore although bore was very simple to use. SINS was used as a predictor of instability, but showed no association with survival. And individual factors like age, preoperative neurology, vertebral levels, visual metastasis showed a positive significant correlation. So we concluded that Tomita score provided the highest statistic, statistical significance followed by Bohr. And SINS showed no correlation with the survival. Then we did another, another study, which is now at the moment in publication. Um, we're looking at disease factors or patient factors, which is more important. So patient factors are age, gender, general condition, preoperative neurology, pain factors, symptom duration, followed by disease factors, tumor histology, number of meds, site, visual <coughs> metastasis. We all included them. And then we looked at it and found that ultimate disease defining variable was the tumor histology. Visual metastasis and level of disease were significant. Patient factors at the time of presentation uh, has to be the performance. Depending on their performance, the outcome and age are the two significant patient factors. So in conclusion, in patients with spinal metastasis, disease factors were more significant than patient factors in determining the overall survival. So in our study, we showed that tumor histology was the main factor followed by performance status. Age was identified as predictor of prognosis as well. Owing to its reflection of an individual's ability to
to bear treatment or not. So, so overall, if I conclude all this, the norms helps us in integrating modern radiation and surgical options and provides evidence-based guidelines for treatment of metastatic spinal tumors. Since addresses spinal instability and make us decide which patients we will operate or not operate or recommend surgery. Modified board is a simple, better predictability score, which is a, a unanimous application all over without even knowing the details of the patient. Patients with spinal cord compression secondary to solid tumor metastasis require decompression if they have got significant neurology. Separation surgery has a role in which stereotactic radio surgery can have a durable tumor control without the need for extensive tumor excision and uh, problems. I thank you all from Pakistan, and I'm going to finish on this. We have got a Middle Eastern Spine Society Congress coming up in Delhi, and all of you are welcome to join um, in April of next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salman. Uh, it was really very updated review of uh, spinal metastasis and very uh, current uh, conclusions. Thank you. Um, maybe welcome. you can see uh, in the in the bottom of line on the chat. Uh, so, uh, Eugen Cesar Popescu is uh, asking a paraplegic patient who had a lung cancer diagnosis, what can you do? What's your answer to that okay. question? As we said, the number one outcome prognosis telling us what the outcome is going to be, the tumor histology. If you've got primary, primary lung cancer, depending on what kind of lung cancer it is, if it's a high-grade tumor, an aggressive tumor, uh, if it's diagnosed six months ago and patient is in bad shape, and you've got complete deficit. So you know that even if you operate on these patients, you're not going to give them any benefit. So tumor histology is number one uh, thing that we need to consider. Patients' condition are, will they be able to bear surgery or not? And if you've got complete um, ACIA, then obviously there is a problem there. And so you need to look at all these things. But obviously, you can apply all the scores, but all the scores are going to give you a bad outcome. So depending on that, obviously all you need is some kind of um, um, radiation if patient can um, afford that radiation. But even if you go to a radiation oncologist who's got this kind of scenario with Frankel A, uh, with Asia A, then your radiation oncologist will probably not yeah. give much of a palliative um, treatment to them. I agree totally, and that could be a factor, and that could be the only indication for giving some kind of radiation. There. So it seems your patient is. Yeah, I agree totally, and then I wouldn't operate such a patient. And in the past, there was a word telling that uh, a patient with paraplegia, uh, after 24 hours of a uh, of a paraplegia, uh, it's better not to operate. Yeah, because the agree uh, the surgery surgery are mostly palliative. Yeah. Uh, Salman, I would ask you: uh, Is there a role of uh, spondylectomy uh, in metastatic disease? If it if it is solitary metastasis, okay. if it is a a uh, low grade tumor like a chondrosarcoma or or let's say renal renal cell carcinoma uh, metastasis from a primary of renal tumor would you consider to perform a tomita surgery or posterior spondylectomy Okay, and all these decisions are again made with the help of oncologists. The reason we, need, as surgeons, need to know these scores is because then we have a fair idea what we, we will be talking to our radiation oncologist or to the oncologist about. Surgery has its role, and yeah, it has its role, and especially if you've got somebody who's got a lesion, who's um, uh, something like, as you said, renal cell, you can think about doing a embolization beforehand. And yes, you can if its patient is uh, fit enough. 
and uh, patient has had metastasis, multiple metastases are not there, prognosis is more than six months, then in those patients you can think about aggressive, complete excision, as I said, in block excision. So that's recommended for probably about 5 to 10 percent of the total patients that we see. Majority of these patients, would, you would not be suggesting a uh, in-block resection per se, because obviously there are uh, good and bad. As, as I said, you could have a, a live patient who's not miserable, or we can make them miserable post-surgery and make them worse. So you, you just need to balance both with the help of your radiation oncologist, with your oncologist, talk to the patient, and depending on uh, what kind of outcome you're, you can give, if you have that facility, then you should do that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is still some questions on the uh, from Dr. Ojan uh, uh, asking if uh, the, that patient with uh, lung cancer, uh, if uh, the patient has a incomplete deficit, what would you do? That obviously, if the patient has incomplete deficit, you can again think about helping that patient if they are fit for something. So depending on uh, if they are very bad shape, you may have incomplete deficit, uh, you need to be thinking that, you know, uh, you cannot cure everybody. So you need to be thinking from those lines. On the other hand, if patient is fit for some kind of surgery, you can think about stabilizing, fusing, decompressing, those patients who have got an incomplete deficit. But again, that, has, that role has to be played once you know if their prognosis is more than six months, once you know that they're fit for surgery. So you need to discuss what kind of surgery, you ha need to have a plan on that, and you need to tell the patient what kind of outcome you're looking at. For example, if it's a um, high-grade tumor, for example, a lung cancer, the outcome in those patients may not be as good as in breast cancer. So it's important to understand that, yeah, if it's a myeloma, you do everything. On the other hand, with lung cancer, if it's high grade, you need to tell them that maybe post-operatively the, uh, the benefit may not be as much as we may are thinking. Okay, I will answer one one comment coming from Dr. Uh, Hassan. Uh, uh, he is telling that. 24 hours paraplegia, do we have some better outcome if we can recompense before 24 hours? No, unfortunately not. This, 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 uh, this is an um, empiric, uh, empiric uh, uh, conclusion that a patient who had, who has had uh, more than 24 hours paraplegia should better not be operated because uh, the the uh, the retrospective studies, uh, class three evidence, are telling that uh, they do not benefit as ambulation uh, to to the surgery. Uh, but they they may have some benefits because of pain. So uh, I don't think. Uh, it's a good idea to operate for a, a, a paraplegic pa patient only for instability. Uh, what do you think about this, Salman? The, is there a good evidence that uh, a time limit has been set up uh, for paraplegia that we must not operate? Yeah, I agree with Mehmet. Uh, I think I've, the only place where I've gone in and operate is uh, somebody young um, who although had complete uh, plegia but had breast metastasis. And that, you know, the only place I've operated there is somebody who's got good prognosis or even with uh, uh, plasitoma or multiple myeloma, you can think about in those patients as well because their outcome um, is pretty reasonable even if they had plagia. But if you've got lung cancer then, or, or uh, any kind of high-grade cancer, then their outcome is not as much, as good as you would like it to be. Yeah. Salman, there is another question. Uh, Dr. Shukru Oral is asking, do you use gamma knife or cyber knife for spinal local metastasis? 
I think uh, obviously uh, both Gamma Knife and Cyber Knife are very effective. Uh, for us, we have both available uh, nearby. Cyber Knife is free of cost, so generally our patients go for uh, Cyber Knife. Having said that, if your department or your hospital has a close collaboration with uh, stereotactic radio surgery, it's worth um, going for that as well. Both of them have similar results, both for um, uh, spinal metastasis, uh, multi-level or single level. Um, and you know they work very well with the separation surgery as well. Okay. Uh, Salman, uh, Dr. Abdirafiz Shehab Eldian is asking uh, for uh, what uh, shall we use as a vertebral augmentation in a metastatic patient? Shall we use bone cement or graft or anything else? I think um, if you are going to be doing a com complete in-block resection, you'll have to use everything. So you would need, a, uh, for example, if you do a complete in-block resection, you would need anterior posterior reconstruction, and for that cement alone won't suffice. So you would need some kind of a cage, maybe a distractible cage. You need pedicle screws, um, depending on um, how many levels we are doing. Um, the most important thing to remember, anytime you do surgery like that, you're not going to be putting hardware in front of the radiation zone. So you're not going to put transverse bars there. You will not put any kind of metal in there for through which a radiation oncologist want to zap that tumor. So you have to think about that when you're reconstructing these patients. So you know whatever you're comfortable with, you can use. But I think it's important do not use crossbar or transverse bar in front of your axis. Salman, uh, I have a comment, I have an answer to that. If uh, the, the survival t uh, time of the patient is longer than one year, it's better to use a graft, bone graft. But if it is less than one year, you can just uh, place cement or cage or anything. Uh, okay, good. I agree. Yes, Honor, want to say something? Yes. Salman, thank you so much for this fantastic yes, Honor. presentation. Everything was uh, very good. The question is that in your daily practice, okay, do you use a classification system or do you recommend any classification system uh, to our colleagues? For? Do you recommend us a classification system? Classification system for? Okay, so okay. Yes, for the spinal metastasis, okay? A patient, they bring their patient, okay? And at that time, uh, you have to yeah. uh, decide oh. and give the patient a recommendation. We have lots of classification systems, uh, uh, yes. SINs, NOMS. Uh, yeah, so what we do is... Yeah, I did not want to confuse people by putting everything there, but I think the conclusion that I said, I'm just going to go back to those conclusions for us to remember that uh, modified bore is the simplest uh, classification system that you can use. Um, the modified Tokohashi and Tumita, they, uh, they can give you excellent predictability, but these three are the ones that we use. So, uh, so I'm going to go back and take you to where the Tomita score is provided the highest statistical significance followed by Bohr and Tokohashi. If you have details, then you can fill in those details in Tomita and Tokohashi. But if a patient comes into your clinic and you have to make a decision, then modified Bohr is much simpler and easier as I showed there. I'm just going to go back and show the simple modified Bohr. Okay, so in this you don't need much. All you need to know is there visceral metastasis or not. This is no lung cancer. Primary tumor is some kind of a good tumor. You get it some score or not. And is there only one solitary skeletal metastasis? So this will give you a general predictability. So if, if you can use this, my, uh, my residents use all of these because obviously, first of all, we are doing a follow-up study. 
So we do all of these and then we continue to correlate that any particular tumor has got a better prognosis with a particular system or not. But this system is the simplest modified bar that you can use. And I think, um, I, yeah, I agree with Mohi and uh, I agree with um, our friends there that we miss them too as well. <laughs> this is really a practical uh, classification system. Thank you so much. Yep. It is very good. Very, very simple. Okay. Uh, I have uh, some more questions that uh, current uh, trend is to apply uh, radio surgery for most of the spine tumors. Am I right? What do you think? Correct, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you can, what you can use both. Whatever facility yeah. Okay. yeah. What okay. about uh, the uh, effect of implants? Sometimes uh, some uh, radio surgeons uh, do not like if there are implants over there uh, to apply uh, radio surgery. Shall we use them or shall we be more careful in our surgeries not to use uh, cages m made of met metals? What do you think? Obviously, it does affect it. But, you know, our radiation oncologists say it does not matter if you, we use a cage in front where the lesion was. It matters where their beam is going to be going in from. So what they say is that, for example, you're putting in pedicle screws, don't use crossbars or transverse link. So don't use anything in between from which their beam is going in. So that's what this is. So when we talk to them, say it's fine using a cage, it's fine using anything metal in front or on site, but where they're coming in from, they don't want um, anything, any metal in between. Yeah. Dr. Selim Ayhan is, is uh, commenting that Probably uh, we shall uh, recommend using carbon pica implants. Uh, and uh, is it is it available in your country? He's asking. It is available, uh, but at the same time, our oncologists are pretty okay about it. They say if you want to use carbon implant, you can use that. If you want to use titanium implant, you can use that they are uh, pretty all right about it. Their only concern is that access from where their um, radiation is going in from should be clear. The door should be open. Uh, Salman, what about using percutaneous tumor ablation techniques? Dr. Erkin is asking this. Do I think they work very well. Um, uh, no, I don't use it, but you know, I have the facility, it's possible we can use it. Uh, but our oncologists up till now have not demanded it, but I think there are recent uh, some studies in which people are using it. We were in Nigeria uh, last week and Scott Robertson was talking about some radiofrequency ablation of the lesion while taking a biopsy at the same time and uh, then uh, in putting in, doing a vertebroplasty as well and showing that they had better results um, instead of just doing vertebroplasty alone in these patients, in which the, only the heat was the factor to knock off the um, uh, tumor itself. So I think th there are new things coming along, and I'm sure this may be um, the future as well, and it, that's going to take up just like we are seeing in brain tumor surgery as well. I will try to answer Dr. Mahmoud Hassan. He's telling, is there a, uh, he's asking, is there an uh, age limit for cyber night or uh, radio surgery? I think there is no age limit, huh? What do you think? I agree, there's no age limit. Obviously, you don't want patient to be, the, the concern our radiation oncologists are that uh, you don't want to be having a patient who's unable to move, who's very weak, you don't want to be making them more weak. So there may be a time where you say, okay, enough is enough, let's stop here. So those are but, the only patients where you should be not sending them there. Yeah. But we must stress that uh, for a cyber knife, it must be a solitary metastasis in one place only, not generalized metastasis. Am I right? Yeah, even if you have 
uh, skip lesions, maybe two or three, then they have shown that uh, you can cyber knife does work. Yeah, but obviously if you've got, you know, whole spine involved and you're trying to do just one level or two level, and if it's a lytic lesion, we know if you give radiation to that area, there's a higher chance of fracture as well. So there are multiple things you need to be thinking about and discussing with the oncologist and, and the family itself, patient itself. What do they want? And take it from there. Okay. One comment for, for the spine instability score. I find it very confusing and complex and it's not easy to use. Yeah, we actually, although somebody has uh, recommended to, to use it, but it is very co confusing. Uh, instead, the, the Tokash score or Tomita scores are easy to use. Some, some the items problem are with not understandable here. Yeah. No, no, the pro problem with Tokohashi or Tomita score is that they are not meant for instability. So for instability, the, uh, the study group came up with it and, you know, uh, when we started out, we were a little confused as well, but not anymore. It's just very simple. For example, location. If it's junction, you get three. Junction meaning if you've got, you know, C7, T1, you've got D12, L1, you've got C1, C2. If it's a mobile segment, which area? Yeah, it tells you which is about. Is it semi-rigid or not? And it so gives you all those explanations. So even my interns are able to fill this in. Yeah. But these are all pre-treatment uh, instability scores. After your treatment, iatrogenic instability may develop. And it is quite confusing still. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm not sure if an, an instability score is really necessary. Okay. Okay. Um, for people who are starting out and for people who do yeah. not have experience as you, then it's not a problem. But for yeah, okay. young people, I think it, this may help, but for senior people, obviously, it doesn't matter. Oh, no, do you have any, any other questions to Salman? You can squeeze him. <laughs> <laughs> You're unable to. <laughs> Everything will <laughs> ask. And, yeah, okay, Dr. Selim Ayam is saying that since the core is not for surgeons, uh, probably not only for surgeons, also for the oncologists to understand if the patient is uh, unstable or not. Um, I must thank Salman yep. for giving the opportunity to discuss that issue, very complex problem, and uh, make us very update about uh, the current trends in, in metastatic spine tumor uh, treatment. Uh, I think we can finish here. I thank all the participants for uh, sparing time uh, with us, for wasting their time with us. I, I uh, hope they enjoyed uh, the webinar. Thank you, Salman, again. Salman, thank, thank you. you so much. Salman, you Thanks training. a lot. And please let us know when, when your next webinar is. Okay. Good. Thank Goodbye. You. I'm I'm stopping here. Okay.